My name is Xavier De La Torre. I'm the superintendent of schools in the Islet Independent School District, and we've got some information we'd love to share with you this evening, but before we get started, I'd like to introduce some special guests. With us this evening, our board president, Ms. Patricia McLean. Also with us from the Eastwood Learning Community, Trustee Debbie Lewis. And your Riverside Learning Community Trustee, Ms. Ana Duenas. We've been looking forward to this opportunity. There's uh, been a lot of uh, interest and speculation relative to the future of the school district, and in particular, how we're going to react to some realities in this school district uh, that aren't as favorable as we'd like. So to better understand what we're going to discuss tonight, what I'd like to do is walk you through what's happened in the school district for about the last 25 years, but certainly for about the last 20 years. And that is that for a long time, for 100 years, this school district has been the flagship school district in the city of El Paso. For most of those years, people left with a high school diploma that meant something. Typically, it meant that that high school diploma guaranteed access to college, university, or work, and the kind of work that would allow an individual not only to support themselves, but to support a family. And so the Islet Independent School District diploma has guaranteed that family remained in this area. For about the last 20 years, that has started to change. Today's high school diploma is a baccalaureate degree. There are less and less jobs, less and less occupations that one can secure with a high school diploma that guarantee a living wage. And so our teachers, our administrators, our support staff, our trustees, they're all dedicated and committed to finding a way to get more and more students into colleges and universities so that they can be successful and so that they can continue to give back to their community. In 1988, this school district had 50,628 students. The district at that time could accommodate almost 59,000 students. Today, this school district has 42,326 students. It has lost about 9,000 students. Almost 9,000 students in a 25-year period. As a matter of fact, since 1988, we've lost students every year with the exception of two years. In 2009 and 2010, we saw modest increases in enrollment of 46 new students and 138 new students, I think, in those two areas. When you lose students, you lose revenue. Now, one might ask, why have we lost students? Has the quality of our educational experience declined in the Islet Independent School District? Not at all. That isn't the reason for the loss of students in this school district. The reality is that most of the residents in the Riverside Learning Community and in this school district have continued to live in our school district, and so their houses have not been available for young families with children to return to the Islet Independent School District. So subsequently, they have found homes on the outskirts of El Paso or in other areas of El Paso. And that's what's really caused the decline in enrollment. But the one thing that is still true is that the Isleta Independent School District is still regarded as the best, or one of the best, public school systems in the city of El Paso. And a testament to that is the fact that of the 42,328 students we currently have in our district, over 6,000 of them do not live in our school district. Every day, 4,000 students come to us from the Socorro Independent School District. Every day, over 2,000 students come to us from El Paso, Canutillo, Clint, other parts of the county, other parts of the city. And the reason they continue to come to Isleta is because they have trust and confidence, and they know, probably based on their own experience, that their children are going to get a quality, world-class education. And that's what we attempt to deliver every day. But when students leave, as in our case, 8,000 students, revenue leaves. That means the money that we get for every student. And when you lose 9,000 students, you get far less money than you used to get. And this district has dedicated any available resources to supporting students. So we've not had the resources to invest in our facilities. 
not to the extent that we'd like. And now the time has come to take a look at how we can reinvest in these facilities because they've continued to decay and deteriorate and they're starting to have an adverse and detrimental impact on the quality of education in this school district. Our teachers are being asked to do more with far less. So to give you an idea of how many students we've lost, I'd like to share some information with you. There are 17,000 empty seats in the school district today. That means that one in three seats, one in three classrooms, are being, are being cooled, heated, lit, insured, and there aren't any students in the classroom. That means that tomorrow, we could close nine elementary schools, four middle schools, and one high school, and still be able to accommodate all 42,328 students in the existing schools, or remaining schools. That means we could eliminate one entire learning community and still be able to accommodate the 42,300 students. If each school that we continue to operate costs us a little over a million dollars annually, it means that we spend $15 million more every year than we should to operate grossly underutilized schools. But here's something that we want to be clear about. We understand that Having seven learning communities, having seven high schools, is part of what the Isleta Independent School District was and is and will continue to be. What's not in question this evening, what's not before the board, what's not even being considered is the closure or consolidation of any high schools. This district will continue to have seven. Riverside High School will continue to be one of our seven comprehensive high schools. So I want to make sure we understand that. Now the reality is that Riverside High School can accommodate 2,400 students, but currently has 1,000 students, 1,060 students. So it's half empty. But we understand that it's part of your community. We understand that it's part of your history. And so it's something that we're likely going to continue and invest in. But we at least have to understand our reality when we talk about how we serve and support students in this school district. This diagram here basically spells out what I just described to you. And that is that with the exception of two years in 2009-10, over the last 25 years, we have lost a significant number of students every year. In terms of schools, it means that if these are the 63 schools in the Isleta Independent School District, these are the schools that one can argue are unnecessary. In other words, you could accommodate all 42,300 students in 46 schools instead of 63 schools at 80%. If you filled your schools at 100%, you'd actually only need 34 schools in this district to accommodate those students. If you look at it by high schools, as I mentioned, you could continue to support this district with one less high school, almost two, with four, less middle schools, with nine less elementary schools. Matter of fact, take a look at this. There are 8,960 empty seats in our elementary schools. Most of the school districts in the state of Texas, the entire school district, aren't as large as 8,960. In detail, it looks like this. Ascot at the elementary school has 235 empty seats and requires about $5 million in resources. An investment of $5 million. Cadwallader, 60% empty, 461 empty seats. They currently have 326 students at that school and it needs $3 million invested. Cedar Grove, 179 empty seats, or one out of every five seats are empty. Holbert, 156 empty seats, or 28%. Ramona, 202 empty seats. Thomas Manor, 465 empty seats, and Thomas Manor needs $10 million of upgrades, replacements, and repairs. This is all information that was presented 
to the staff and to the board by a neutral third party engineering firm, internationally known, internationally recognized, its objective unvarnished and candid. They were simply asked to do two things. One, determine the capacity and utilization in our schools, and two, determine what it would cost to repair or replace current needs at each and every one of our 63 schools and needs that we should anticipate over the next four years. And I want to say that again because one of the things that I don't want you to walk away with is that if you invest 4.9 or $5 million in Ascarate Elementary School, that you've addressed all of the needs. You've only addressed the needs that they currently have this year and that they're likely to have for the next four years. That means that in year six, you could look at another $5 million bill. So the investment is significant. And the investment is significant, and all we're talking about is nothing that's going to improve the school or enhance the school. It's going to repair and replace the school so it looks the same way it looked in 1934 or 1938, whenever it was built. Here's the analogy. There are a lot of people that like to take old cars that they either find in a salvage yard or that they find in someone's garage that maybe has left us. And if they have enough money, they can invest in that 1963 Corvette and they can make it look exactly the way it looked in 1963 when it sat in the Chevrolet showroom. But you're still gonna have to roll the windows up like this. Right? Some of you young people don't realize that there was a time when you actually had to roll up the windows like this, but some of you do remember, right? The wipers only have one speed. The seats don't get warm, the seats don't get cool, and if you're like me, you'll spend half of your life lost because it won't have GPS. So you'll get a brand new, beautiful Ascarate for $5 million, but it's still a school that was designed to support children in the 1930s, not in 2016. It may or may not be able to accommodate current technologies and emerging technologies. It's unlikely we can install interactive whiteboards. It's unlikely we can do much repair and renovation because one of the things that we have to be cognizant of and careful of is that some of these old schools were built with materials that may not be safe for students and adults. Materials like asbestos. So we don't have the benefit or the latitude or the liberty to necessarily modify and remodernize some of these schools because we risk the danger of disrupting some of the materials in the building that could be harmful to people. So we need to think carefully before we make an investment of $5 million on a school that was built in the early 20th century. And so we've given that some thought. Here's our middle school, high school reality. And that is that Riverside Middle School needs an investment of $6.7 million. There are 326 empty seats. Riverside High School needs an investment of almost $12 million. And there are 1,220 empty seats. The school is half filled. So it begs the question, what should we do then if we want to improve our schools would the community then support investing that kind of money on schools that, in all fairness, are being grossly underutilized? And the only reason I give you that as background is because people have asked, how did the district arrive at the idea to consolidate Riverside Middle School and Riverside High School? So I want to bring clarity to that. The district did not arrive at that recommendation. The district did not suggest that we consolidate Riverside Middle School and Riverside High School. The neutral third party that we hired to do an analysis of our schools in our school district made that recommendation. They simply looked at it from a logical standpoint. 
They saw a high school that could accommodate 2,400 students that currently has 1,090 students, and they saw a middle school that currently has 600 plus students, and they wondered why we couldn't combine the two schools, create two different entry points, and create a physical barrier that would create a separate and distinct experience for the two groups of students. So it's not illogical or irrational that they arrived at that. I'm relatively certain that the majority of the people in this gym don't support that, but they weren't asked to try and anticipate or predict whether or not the community would support that. They were simply asked, what would you do if you were in our situation and you wanted to be fiscally responsible? And that's what they came up with. So the first point is that that recommendation did not emerge from the Board of Trustees and it certainly didn't emerge from the staff. It came from a neutral third party that lives in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. That's how they arrived at that. No recommendation has been made to the board. The board hasn't had a discussion around whether or not consolidating Riverside Middle School and Riverside High School makes sense, but we're aware of it as an idea. If you look here, this is the number of seats you have in the Riverside Learning Community. You have 8,624 seats or desks. You're currently using 4,397 of them. Ten years from now, you're still going to currently be using 4,322. In other words, there isn't any event or series of events that are going to happen between now and 2024 that's going to change the enrollment of students in the Riverside Learning Community. The same number of kids that we currently serve and support will be the same number 10 years from now. Here's this. I want you to remember that. That doesn't say Dr. Delatore, does it? Or Xavier. Or the Isled Independent School District Board of Trustees. That's Jacobs. That's the engineering firm that came up with this plan right here. Here's the way they arrived at their plan. They simply, like I said, they looked at Riverside High School built in 1969. It takes 10 to $12 million to address the need. There's currently 1,066 students. It can accommodate 2,431. High school, middle school. Consolidate the high school and the middle school into a 712 configuration. That's how they arrived at it. Now, neither the board or I are bound by their recommendation. The reason we've come out to seven different high schools is to get your feedback, your input, as to what you think about the Jacobs recommendation. Similarly, if you look at the elementary schools, they say, consolidate from six to three. Repurpose Cadwallader for transition program. Land Bank Thomas Manor Consolidate Ascarate with Cedar Grove, repurpose Ascarate for community use, and consolidate Ramona with an expanded Hulbert. That's their recommendations. Now what I'd like to do tonight is I'd like to share with you what we're likely to recommend to the board. And I'd like you to make sure that you make a distinction between what Jacobs has recommended and what the staff or my administrative team, all very capable people, are considering as a recommendation to the board. Ultimately, though, the only people that can determine what we do down the road with not just the Riverside Learning Community, but with the district in general, is the Board of Trustees. We're likely to recommend the following. As I said, we're likely to recommend that Riverside High School continue to be Riverside High School, a 912 comprehensive high school that currently accommodates a thousand students and if you include the vocational ed program an additional 300 400 students every year we respect the fact that the Riverside learning community deserves to have their own comprehensive high school where we may not agree with Jacobs is whether or not it merits a 12 million dollar investment 
given that the school is at 50% capacity? That's the question. Do you invest $12 million in a facility that you know is going to be half empty most of the time? Do you invest half of that? In most cases, you can't. When you decide to install new roof, new air conditioning, new tile, new rug, interior paint, doors, hardware, glass, when you decide to do all that, you can't do half of it, right? There's no one here who has done half of their home because that was all the budget afforded, right? Wouldn't be attractive, neighbors might get irritated. We also respect and understand that middle school parents would prefer to have their middle school students separate and apart from high school students. We understand that, but again, the Jacobs group wasn't asked to understand how you might feel or what you value. They were asked to do what they thought was the most effective and efficient. So we're likely to recommend that we make an investment in Riverside Middle School and that we continue to support the principal and the teachers and the support staff at Riverside Middle School and to look for ways to help them increase enrollment by introducing innovative and attractive programs. That's what we're likely to recommend. When it comes to the elementary schools, though, it's a little different. Whoops. We agree that given the current condition of a Scott at the elementary school, that it may make sense to consolidate it with Cedar Grove. And what we believe is that if it costs $3 million to address Ascarate and another $4 million to address the needs at Cedar Grove, that maybe what we should do is invest all $8 million at Cedar Grove and accommodate both of those student bodies in one school. That's true. That's true. That's something that is being seriously considered. We also think that having a school with 320 students when it can accommodate 800, 900 students is not a good use of space, energy, and utility. So what we'd like to do is we'd likely recommend that Cadwallader and Thomas Manor be consolidated, but that before we do that, we build a brand new Thomas Manor Elementary School. A new state-of-the-art, elementary school, multi-story with refrigerated air that shows that we respect and support the teachers that work with the nearly 800 students that would attend school there. That while we appreciate and acknowledge that Cadwallader Elementary School is part of this community, that it's inadequate to educate children and prepare children for the 21st century. And that both the children at Thomas Manor and the children at Cadwallader deserve a brand new school. That will likely be the recommendation. Ramona's doing some exciting things with Western Refining. And Ramona could very well become our first STEM elementary school. So we're going to recommend that we invest in Ramona Elementary School and that those children get the benefit of that investment. And finally, Holbert. Holbert is the newest of all of these schools. And it's had some structural challenges, not enough attention was paid to the soil condition when the school was built back in, I believe, 2003. So the school is only 10, 11 years old. We certainly have to invest in that school. Now, it will take an investment to make sure that we address the structural issues, but Constance Holbert will continue to be a school in the Islet Independent School District. Now, the issue of Cadwallader and Ascarate is a sensitive issue. One might say, you should recommend to the board that you land bank both schools and that you put them up for sale because they are attractive, attractive properties on Alameda. At present, what we're prepared to do is relocate the Isleta Adult and Community Education Program from its current location to Ascarate so that we can continue and use that facility as an educational institution not sell, not demolish, not land bank the school because we understand that it could be perceived by many as a historical site. But that will be our recommendation. Let's move our adult school there. Our adult school supports almost 700 adults in helping get their GED, their citizenship, and other um, assistance with learning 
uh, English as a second language. So let's continue to use the facility, but let's use it for the adults. And because they're adults and they have higher tolerance, we're not going to invest a lot of money in air conditioning and things like that. We're simply going to provide them with a, we believe, an appropriate facility to continue their learning. And with Cadwaller, similarly, what we'd like to do is we'd like to move our TLCC program into Cadwaller so that we can give those students with special needs their own environment to continue and grow and develop. Part of what we also did was we had a group of community leaders that made up both a facility assessment committee as well as an equity and enhancement committee. And this committee was supposed to go out to the schools to see beyond the construction of schools and beyond the repairs, are there things that our students currently don't have access to that students in other school districts have access to? Especially those students who go to school in districts where they've experienced accelerated growth, and so with accelerated growth, they've got additional resources, and they've used those resources to make sure their students have a 21st century learning environment and a 21st century experience. And so these 49 individuals went out and they looked across the district and they've made recommendations. In addition to those individuals, we had subcommittees look at our athletic programs and facilities, our visual and art programs and facilities, and the state of technology in the district. And they came back and this is what they recommended that we consider as part of our facility master plan. They asked that we consider some of the schools in our area that seem to have amenities, opportunities, and facilities that can't be found anywhere in the Islet Independent School District. For example, the Islet Independent School District is the only district that has yet to place artificial surface in each and every one of its stadiums. They'd like us to consider doing that. They'd like us to consider replacing the current sod that, by the way, we spend $420,000 a year to rebuild every year with an artificial surface. It would support water conservation, and we believe it would reduce the incidence of injuries to ankles, knees, and the one that's really gained a lot of attention lately, concussions. We believe it makes sense to invest in this artificial surface at all seven stadiums in the district. They also indicated that they'd like to see improvements to gymnasiums, locker rooms, training rooms, and auxiliary gyms. They'd like to see lighting, scoreboards, sound systems, indoor and outdoor facilities upgraded. Softball and baseball field upgrades. This one I get excited about. One of the things that we'd like to propose or ask the board to consider is putting lighting on all of the baseball and softball fields at each of the seven high schools so that our student athletes can compete in the evening. As it stands right now, we pull kids out of class sometimes two, three times a week so that they can get ready for a ball game. They're out of class by 11, 1230, because if they don't start the game at two or three o'clock in the afternoon, it gets dark and they can't finish the game. Why can't we be the district that puts and installs this lighting on the field so that students can remain in class where instruction is respected, they can still complete their school day, get ready for the ball game, and have a ball game at five o'clock in the evening and not worry about whether or not it's gonna get dark. The other benefit to that is, and I happened to play football and baseball when I was in high school, and, and what was true today is true, what was true today then is true today. I got pulled out of class two, three times a week too. But the other thing that would happen is, unlike football programs or volleyball and basketball programs, baseball players oftentimes can't share the experience with their parents because their parents are working at two o'clock and three o'clock in the afternoon. Wouldn't it be nice if parents could actually participate in softball, baseball players' activities because they're held in the evening under the lights? Wouldn't that generate a sense of community, a place to get together? That's why we'd like to introduce lighting to these fields and include tennis courts in some cases and soccer fields in other cases so that the school can continue to be an asset to the community. And so we'll make that recommendation to the board and see whether or not it's feasible to do something like that. 
The other suggestions, a centralized indoor-outdoor golf facility, and then there have uh, been suggestions and there's been an interest in maybe having our own natatorium or aquatic center for our swim programs in the district. And all of these have to be considered, but they come with a price tag and that has to be considered as well. In terms of fine arts, what we're really excited about is the possibility of building a performing arts center off of Alameda where the fine arts annex is currently located. It's the location of the old district office. This performing arts center could accommodate anywhere from 1,500 to 2,500 spectators in a two-tiered theater setting with a UIL rated stage so that our visual and performing art programs have a place to perform for their families and for their community. That's something that's being discussed. In addition to that, we're discussing a significant investment in other areas of visual and performing arts. And finally, technology. We've got to do something to provide students and our teachers and support staff with expanded technology. We cannot allow our students to fall behind other students because we don't have access to current technologies, emerging technologies, and future technologies because we insist on keeping facilities and buildings and learning environments that cannot support the kind of energy that we need to power some of this technology. That's an interest that the subcommittee introduced us to. Number three we think is important. We think every school should have a safety kiosk. A safety kiosk is a single point of entry at every school where the only people that can enter this, the school are parents and other adults who have registered to be on the premises and who would have to use a swipe card to get into the school. And that without that swipe card, no one gets in because student safety is our single most important priority in this school district. So we'd like all of the entry areas in our schools to have this technology available so that anyone entering our school is captured on surveillance video and has to swipe to get into the school in an effort to protect and insulate our students from this. <laughs> None of this comes without a cost. So we're going to talk a little bit about everybody's least favorite subject, taxes, property taxes. The first thing is it's important that as members of the community, you be ambassadors to accurate information. Whereas there have been other bonds and other measures that have seen increases or have caused an increase in taxes for senior citizens, the one exception are school bonds. School bonds do not impact individuals who are 65 years or older. So that's important for people to know. The second thing is that there's a misconception that taxpayers in the Islet Independent School District pay more taxes than anybody else in the area. And that's also not true. And let me show you why. Let's use a home valued at $70,000. And that home is in the Socorro Independent School District, the Isleta Independent School District, and the El Paso Independent School District. In one of these school districts, before anything happens, there's a 20% homestead exemption. That means the value of your home is reduced by 20% automatically. So whereas the value of the home in Socorro stays at 70,000 and stays at 70,000 in El Paso, the value of the $70,000 home in the Riverside community in the Isleta Independent School District is automatically reduced to $56,000. In addition to that, the state guarantees another $15,000 exemption. Both Socorro and El Paso can take advantage of that $15,000 exemption. That takes their home value from 70 to 55, but guess what? So does the Islet Independent School District get that $15,000. All of a sudden, a home that is valued at $70,000 in the Islet Independent School District will be taxed at $41,000. Not at $70,000, not at $55,000, at $41,000. Here's the current tax rate. They have $1.27 and $1.24 in the neighboring school districts. 
Just by looking at that, one would assume that we pay more taxes than they do because we have a $1.36 rate today. The reality is even with a $1.36, because it's being applied to $41,000 and not $55,000, generates a much lower tax burden in the Islet Independent School District than in either of the other two school districts. Significantly lower, almost $150 a year less than what they would pay in Socorro and in El Paso. This $1.46 is a 10 cent increase on the current rate. A 10 cent increase is unheard of. People rarely increase the property tax rate by 10 cents because the reaction would be aggressive. And yet, if we do it just for hypothetical reasons, we can increase this tax rate by 10 cents for every $100 of your home's value, and you're still not gonna pay as much as they pay in Socorro or they pay in El Paso. A lot of people don't know that. So in the Isleta Independent School District, the opinion of one, just my opinion, our children have received the best education offered in the city of El Paso for the lowest investment. And this isn't the investment, this is the investment. So yes, nobody likes to see an increase in taxes, but I think it's at least important that we recognize that in present, we may not be adequately funding the education that the next generation of students need. And I'm not gonna be cavalier about anybody's personal financial situation. All I wanna do is make sure that you're aware of that and you can either embrace it or discount it, but what I just showed you is the truth. It is indisputable. We pay less taxes than El Paso residents and we pay less taxes than they pay in Socorro and we have better schools or better education programs. Our students outperform their students. And then we wonder why our schools haven't received the resources that they need in terms of the facility. It's because we've not made the investment in the schools. And so that's what's gonna be asked of our residents. Because again, the board doesn't have the 400 or 500 million dollars to implement the ideas that I just shared with you. They simply don't have it. The only people that can make what I just shared with you a reality is you. So there's no, there's no emotion or anything like that. People can simply vote either to support or not support the plan. And we, as elected officials, and I, as their employee, will accept the will of the people. But it would be a disservice to the students if I didn't at least speak on their behalf and advocate for them and their teachers and our school district. Ultimately, though, you can decide whether or not you think it's a feasible plan or whether it's excessive, but you don't need to tell me. You simply need to put it in the ballot box. If you're interested in calculating your own tax rate increase, you can go to this website right here, put in the value of your home, and it would tell you what kind of increase you can expect. Other than that, I'm at your disposal to ask it, answer any questions that you may have. Yes, sir. Teachers. Yes, sir. It's been a... a You're going to have artificial turf on, on football fields. Why not put it on the baseball fields? Okay. You'll, you'll, you'll be having... You'll, you'll still be cutting grass over here and not over here. That's true. Wouldn't it be better? It certainly would be better. Okay, there were two questions. The first was, what happens to teachers? The answer is, nothing adverse, nothing detrimental can happen to teachers because teachers are hired based on the number of students we have in the district. The number of students isn't being reduced. So if you take a group of students, 300 students from Cadwallader, and you move them to Thomas Manor, their teachers would follow them because those students still need teachers. Those teachers still need support staff those students still need cafeteria workers and custodians. The personnel, the adults, go with the students. The exception is that when you consolidate a school, you only need one principal, one nurse, one librarian. Please understand that every year over 200 people leave the district. They retire, they resign, they relocate, and that they leave behind vacancies that can be used to accommodate the principal, the librarian, the nurse, 
and that it takes 18 months just to build a brand new school. That's plenty of time to be thoughtful and deliberate about where we would place people that may ultimately be displaced. I'm almost done. Your second question was, why not do the baseball fields? That's a great question. Why not do the baseball fields? We can increase taxes even more, and we can do baseball and softball fields. We can do whatever it is you'd like to do, but it costs money. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. As I was, uh, for the last, uh, going on two hours, trying to get some information, and I did get some information. But if, if we really look as a community to see, look, all this is already on the table. The thing is, is that we've got to change our attitude by converting, converting new thinking. In other words, it, it's, it's a new order of thinking in which uh, you won't be able to, you can actually, because you touched on it uh, at the very beginning, you can actually bring students in buses to, re to the, the, uh, the district. Very simply, because we have the best, what, education. We have the best education, and we're not doing it. And we're not even moving. The last, uh, almost the, the, the last year has nobody, I mean, you've done what you, you got to do, only you guys know, but at the same time, I don't think that, that uh, our, our school has to become to say, okay, we're going to be really the new Isleta Independent School District, period. And it's not by, by, by anything else, but by actually doing, okay? Like, for instance, I'm 250 pounds. I'm going to have to wrestle a guy that's 300 pounds. Who's going to win? Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. La Torre, uh, my name is Manny Moreno. Uh, I've lived in this community for 37 years. I had a daughter and a son graduate from Ursa High School. Both of them wanted to be science and engineering professionals. And, uh, you know, I have a lot of pride in this district and the school and everything. Uh, I was somewhat skeptical coming in here. Uh, being a retired engineer, I worked 30 years for an aerospace and defense company. I like the fact you had an engineering firm do that because, you know, we, we always made changes and decisions based on data and facts. The only question I've got is this, is that uh, one thing that concerns me is the quality of education in the United States as a whole. You hear and hear uh, studies that are done, and, and now we're down at 14th or 17th or something worldwide. So my question is this, when the Jacobs engineering firm did their study, did they take into consideration or have a threshold as to where is the line between quantity and quality. In other words, I've known for a fact that, that the smaller the classroom, the better the education because of the better the interface between the teacher and the student. So is there a threshold? And was that taken into consideration? Yes, uh, one of the things that the, the district has supported and will continue to support is the idea that class size reduction can improve the experience for students. So one of the things that we have done as a district, and this is prior to my arrival, is there's been a significant investment in making sure that the student-teacher ratio never leaves the 20 to 1 at the elementary school and the currently 22 to 1 in our secondary schools. So it costs us a little bit more, and it increases the number of teachers that we have in the district. And for every teacher that we add to make sure that we continue to have small classrooms, uh, it's, it's a $55,000 investment, as you know. And so we've intentionally, as a district, done that now for over a decade to try and create a learning environment that's more manageable for the teacher. I think what we're trying to do are two other things. One is we're investing in the adults. We believe that unless you invest in the adult, the student isn't going to improve until the experience in the classroom improves. But part of that has to do with providing our adults with uh, facilities that are at appropriate and adequate and sometimes putting teachers in there even with 22 students if it's 110 degrees outside and there's no refrigerated air and it's evaporated coolers and kids come in from the outside and they're dusty and they're dirty it makes it difficult for these teachers to feel like what they're doing is valued 
So one of the things that we did talk to the Jacobs group about was we're not necessarily looking for luxuries or things that can be seen as excessive. What we want you to do is help us create classroom environments that demonstrate that we respect the teaching profession. And so what you see up there is really just an investment in schools that we shouldn't expect that they be in any better condition. They've been with us since the 1910s and the 1920s. We just haven't done a good enough job of reinvesting in our schools to try and transform them so that they're more appropriate for today's world. But you're absolutely right. Yes? Good evening, sir. Good evening. I'm sorry. Um, if you're trying to put Escarate and Cedar Grove together, is that correct? That's, a, that's been a suggestion, yes, sir. Okay. For instance, on the sixth grade level, how many kids per classroom do you have in Escarate? How many kids per average do you have in Cedar Grove? The same. It's what is that? The number in elementary school is how many? 20 to 1. 20 to 1. Yes. 20 kids per classroom? Yes. Do, so if, say you move the students from Scarate to Cedar Grove. Yes. How many classrooms do you have available in Cedar Grove for these kids? There's 115 no. empty seats. That okay. would equal, yes. I'm asking, for example, six grades. Yes. You say 20 per classroom? Yes at Escarate and at Cedar Grove. Uh -huh. Once you combine them, how much room do you have to bring those kids to keep this classroom to a minimal where they, where they can learn and where their teacher can be able to teach? It's touching part on the question that he, he brought up. Mm -hmm. The quantity of kids is gonna grow. Yes. How many kids do you expect to have per classroom? 20 to one. That's what you have right now. Yes. Do you have that room at Cedar Grove? We will, Available. Yes. See this money right here? Three million here and another 3.8 million here? That's almost seven million dollars. We can expand Cedar Grove to accommodate every child at Ascarate. So you, you, you're not gonna put portables or anything like that? No, not portables. We're going to construct an additional wing at Cedar Grove to accommodate the students at Ascarate. Well, and uh, are, are sure, for sure our taxes will go up. And you're saying what you mentioned was what? $10 per 100000 No, I, I think it was $0.10 cents for every $100. Cents for and again, I can't make your taxes go up. Only you can make your taxes go up. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question. Why is it that you invest in some schools more than you invest in other schools? because not all the schools are in the same condition, and so we're not trying to apply a template where every school gets $5 million, because not every school was built in the same year. They've been built in different years, and in some cases, some schools have already had improvements. In other cases, schools have been expanded. So every school is treated as a separate and distinct project. Yes, but like I see the difference. My son plays sports, and I see the difference when you go to Eastwood Middle, this school is humongous, brand spanking new. Yes, it is. But then Riverside, what you got? We gave you gave us a new gym, and we are supposed to be satisfied with that? Do you right. know? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I understand what, I'm saying. I mean, what I know, I have friends that, that go to school there. Their kids have all these things and stuff. Why doesn't Riverside Middle have it? They Good have question. French. They have all these different you know, language arts, and they have um, something about, what was it? Like journalism and photography. Riverside doesn't have that. Riverside Middle doesn't have that. Maybe if you would bring that to them, more kids, instead of going to Eastwood, they would stay here. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, sorry. Uh, can I go more into detail? Um, how would the middle school and high school work together? I don't want to see a, like a senior going after eighth graders. Can you explain? I mean, as it is, I know how kids are in middle school. So now if you're bringing them to the high school, I just don't want to see seniors going out with seventh or eighth graders. Right. No, I, I completely understand. Now, again, you may have arrived late. And I think um, I mentioned that that would not be the recommendation. 
that that recommendation came from the Jacobs group, that that recommendation wasn't um, discussed with the board, that recommendation isn't coming from the superintendent and senior staff, that, came, that simply came from the report. I think what I mentioned was that our recommendation is likely, or more than likely to be, that we go ahead and invest in the high school and in the middle school. Um, more of a, of a comment than a question. Okay. So, I went to several of the other meetings. Yes. I went to Isleta, I went to Bel Air, Del Valle, Eastwood. Sounds and like now you went tonight, to all of them. <laughs> almost all of them. Okay. Now, one of the things that, you know, I, I don't get me wrong, love the idea of an aquatic center, love the idea of a fine arts center. Mission Valley is falling apart, Thomas Manor is falling apart. Don't get me wrong. I'm not denying those kids anything. But when it comes to the plan for the Riverside area, I think we have a problem, a big problem. Because what the Jason report says is, it just basically looks at numbers. And I'm not gonna dispute that their numbers are incorrect and I'm not upset about that. But it outlines a greater issue here. And that greater issue is, is that over the years, the people that have come to Riverside to be educated have had it harder than any other school, okay? When the lady that spoke just before me was, was talking about, about what we have here as far as facilities, Riverside was, is the only school in the entire district and probably in the city whose football stadium was not built by the district. It was built by a third party, okay? It was the first school that had a flag corps with the marching band. It had a cyber cafe. It had programs like the small schools concept like the, like the Socratic Institute, it had the engineering, it had the medical. All of that was taken away over the years. And you've given it to Bel Air, you've given it to Del Valle, you've given it to Eastwood. Okay. So when we look at the numbers from the Jacobs Report, it's not just about the Riverside area being landlocked and that there are no homes available. You said in the first meeting that you had at Central Office that 80 students from the Riverside area go to Eastwood High School. Why? That's almost 10%. If the, if the population of Riverside is 1,000, that's almost 10% of the students that live in this area that should be coming to Riverside High School, but yet go to Eastwood High School, okay? And we're not even talking about the other high schools, okay? That is a sign of a larger problem. I work for a fortune. I work for a Fortune 500 engineering powerhouse, okay? I can tell you what it is like to compete with people that were educated in India, in China, in Mexico, in Europe. I can tell you what you guys are up against, okay? You can't sit here and say with what we have, I mean, I look up at the ceiling and we have duct tape that's holding the lights together, okay? We have a science wing whose sewage is coming up, okay, that was just built, okay? And despite all of, those, all of those obstacles, we've had people that have graduated from this high school that have become lawyers and engineers. You have, you have, you have, a, you have competitive sports teams that have produced a Final Four in soccer, baseball, and basketball. You have a competitive band program that despite their size, beat out Franklin and Chapin this year in the fall. And, and is the only school, despite whatever your political beliefs are, it is the only school that has a state governor as its alum, okay? So, so, and I'm not going to deny Eastwood because I went to the Eastwood meeting last night, okay? And you promised Eastwood High School a brand new building, okay? All right? And I've seen Eastwood High School and it is in terrible shape. Don't get me wrong, their gym is probably worse than this one, hands down, okay? But Riverside has some very big problems that over the years have been neglected time and time again, and nothing has been done about it. And I understand you can't change the past, but what I'm seeing right here and what is being presented, the future doesn't look any different. It looks as business as usual, okay? The sacrifice that the Riverside area is having to give up 
pales in comparison to the sacrifices that the other areas are going to give up, and they're getting more than what we are getting down here. You said last night, and I'm going to quote it, I'm going to try and quote it as best I can, if you're not taking care of your young and you're not taking care of your old, then you lack character. And the Isleta Independent School District, coupled with the city of El Paso, have shown a lack of character in this area for years. Thank you. I just, I, just had, I just had two questions, um, and I, I might have missed this earlier, but what's the plan in the interim from when you close one school and, and make the expansion for the others? Because I think that's the gentleman was, was wanting to know, is if you have enough physical space in the interim. The second question um, that I have is, what's going to be done with the property? Is that going to be sold to provide taxpayers relief, or what are you going to do with that? Let me answer the second question first, is that in the Riverside area, there isn't actually any property that would be available under our proposal, because Cadwallader would be repurposed for the TLCC program, and Ascarate would be used for the Isleta Adult and Community program. So we actually don't have any land in the Riverside area that we're considering putting up for sale. So that would remain. In terms of swing space, let me give the Cadwallader Thomas Manor scenario. What we might ask is that Thomas Manor students move to Cadwallader for the 18 months that it takes to build a brand new elementary school. And then they would both return to the brand new elementary school before we introduced the TLCC program at Cadwallader. So we would use swing space, and in some cases we may have to add portables while we construct additional wings or additional um, facilities. I have a couple of questions. Yes, the first one is, I like the, the plan. Yes, ma'am. But what is the plan for the future? You're saying that all the schools are not upgraded. What's going to happen in 50 years? Are you guys going to demolish all the schools again? No, or I, what's the future plan? Right, so what we're doing is we're trying to address those that are most pressing based on the Jacobs report, those that need immediate attention, like your Mission Valleys, your Thomas Manors, your Eastwoods. We're trying to address those. It is likely that seven, eight, nine years down the road, we may have to come back to the voters and say, now we've got a new group of schools that we need to reinvest in. Schools cannot be expected to survive for infinity, mm -hmm. right? It just doesn't work that way. So sooner or later, as part of this facility master plan, we'd have to start addressing those schools that aren't being addressed now and it's basically a deferred maintenance program. So you can't do them all, but you really need to focus on those that are in really, really bad shape. And that's the, the ones that the Jacobs Group identified. For all the others, we at least need to consider introducing the refrigerated air and fixing all of the mechanical systems, electrical systems, so that they can at least power up some of the technology that we'd like to introduce into those schools. Okay, and um, the second thing, you said that uh, you were trying to do the tax free for the 65 and older. How about those students that come from Clint, Horizon, Far East, that are from other districts and they come to the Isleta and use their grandparents' house right. as an address? Right, so the grandparents may be already paying property taxes, but to answer your question, their parents are not, right? But if you stop to, th to, to think about this, if there are 6,000 students that come from outside the district into our district and we get about $7,000 for every one of those students that if we were not an open enrollment district would still be in their district. You multiply 7,000 times 6,000, it's $42 million that come into our budget every year that at present pay teachers, support staff, and principals. So if overnight this district decided, and it would be likely impossible that this district can ever retreat from open enrollment, because to retreat from open enrollment could create a situation where overnight you'd lose $42 million. Do you know how many teaching positions are tied up in those $42 million? Thousands. And we simply can't do that to our teachers. But that's a very good but question. But where is that $42,000 coming from? The $42 million comes from the state. That's what we from get for state. every student. Yes. Yes. Well, 
Yeah, what we'd like to do with the Thomas Manor campus is rather than leave it a single story campus, is make it a two story elementary school to create additional space at the park for a playground. For the, uh, that's a city park? Yes. Are no, you gonna but some of that property is ours. What, what property is yours? The Thomas Manor property. Yes, I understand, but you're going to have 300 more students. Yeah, we're going to go two stories. Yes, for, that's for the students, for playgrounds. You're going to have, you're going to be crowded out there for recess, after school, and all that. That's 900 students there. Where are you going to put all those kids? We're going to accommodate it within the existing property. We've already looked at it, and we've already designed where the building would go. Wouldn't it be better if you work with the city of El Paso and improve the park? We can certainly do that. This is early now. Because I'm, I'm the vice president of the association. Then you, you could, and I are going together. Then we can work with, with the city so they can improve our facilities. I, I certainly would like a, you know, a... Uh, because you're going to have more city. students playing in the playgrounds, mm -hmm. right? Yes, sir. Okay, let's work with the city then. Okay, we'd like to. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, Dr. De La Torre, board members, Riverside community. My name is Beatriz Sada, and I was on the facilities committee for the community which visited our schools. And I can truly tell you that everything you've heard here today is really a mild description of what really has happened. I would like to begin with telling you that the principals and the faculty and the custodial staff of our schools do a beautiful job to, to completely contain, continue to provide a wonderful education for your students in spite of the difficult needs they have. From the ceiling, the roofs that leak, the heating, the air conditioning, the plumbing, and electrical facilities which will not support our technology, which is our most important need to me. I graduated from a Scarity school, so you know how old a Scarity school is. <laughs> and I hate to see it go, but Dr. De La Torre realizes that it's a historical building. It's one of the prettiest things we have on Alameda. You all know what Alameda looks like. <laughs> Cadwalter is a historical building. It's one of the nicest buildings we have on Alameda. We need to protect that. Isleta High School, I'm a graduate of Isleta High School, sorry Riverside, is also a historical building. We need to keep them. I will say that I think the bond, if it's managed correctly, and I probably won't live long enough to see it completed, will be a wonderful donation to the population that's going to come. Someone paid for my education, someone paid for yours, now it's our turn to pay it forward. Thank you. I would, I would like to ask Dr. De La Torre and the board to please give us this specific description of what is going to be done on the campus, the timeline, and the cost, because we don't want to have what happened in the El Pasos with their new proposition. Now they're fighting about how much money for this and how much money for that, and no, it goes in my district, no, it goes in. If it could all be written, and we could have the board and the superintendent administration carefully watch it for us, I think the communities would all come out feeling better, but we need to know exactly what we want to do when we go vote. Another thing I'm going to tell you too, and I'm going to be an old lady here. You're going to say, lady, sit down, stop lecturing, but I'm a retired teacher too. <laughs> we got to vote. This community has the lowest voting ratio of any area in the city. It's your right, it's your responsibility, and you have an opportunity to express yourself. Win or lose, you still expressed yourself. Okay, let's go for it. Thank you, Dr. De La Torre. Thank you, ma'am. Hey. Oh. My name is J.J. Ortiz. I have no kids in school. I just have some co comments. Yes, sir. 
I've lived in this area a long time, and I was just wondering, uh, why do you have to get the, the highest uh, engineering companies or these guys to do these surveys? You pay them a lot of money that could be used for other things. <laughs> growth. You have growth. Uh, I've lived here since Thomas Manor was suitable for everything. Now it's not suitable. What about the growth of the city? The growth of the city. And are you giving up money for the for education of the kids? This uh, seems to be the the formality that you all ha uh, give us the opportunity to speak up, and nothing is ever done about it. It's, there's a lot of growth. Before it was a, a one family per house, and it's gonna be now both men and wife have to work. You need two cars. All the growth. Why wasn't that figured? A long time ago, now it's come to, down to us. Yes, life is much and, more complex. Uh, and the CEOs get a bigger uh, uh, raises. Everybody gets a raise. All at the expense of the residents of the communities in this area. Yeah. Good afternoon. Can you please tell the community once again how much you're asking from us? 400 or 500 million? We don't know. Roughly? Between 400 and 500 million. Okay, because you were very subtle on the number. Thank you for your clarification. Hello, good evening. Hi, good evening. Um, personally, we brought our kids from the El Paso district into the Isleta Independent School District for one reason, especially to Ramona Elementary. Because that school, the one-on-one -on -one was great and it is still great. Yes, it is. And my daughter learned so much and now she's at Riverside Middle and her grades are amazing too. My thing to you is this. If you were to invest more into Riverside, then you would have more kids. We wouldn't be have to going through this. We don't. Now, I want to know what's going to happen to Ramona Elementary. Is anything going to change there? Because you know what? My daughter, and I'm expecting my son running around, he's going to go to Ramona too. So I want to know the future of Ramona Elementary because that school is amazing. And my daughter, my other daughter, and my son are going to go there. But I just want to know, what's the future for Ramona Elementary? I'll tell you what I know because the future is determined by the decisions that... Right now, on your were, statistics that you just gave us, what's gonna happen? Were you here happen? when I discussed Corona? Yeah, I, I was here. What did I, I say? And I see the, what you're putting on the screen. I want you to tell me, please. I thought I just did. I said we're gonna invest in Ramona. You're gonna invest, so we're not gonna close the Ramona down. <laughs> we're going to invest in That's Ramona Elementary School. So, so, okay, great, that's all so I wanted to clarity, know. Just for invest doesn't mean close it down. That's what I'm saying. As long okay. as my kids get a good education there, and you know what? Please, just please, put it in your mind and into your investments, into Jacobs and all those guys, that you know what? Invest a little bit more in Riverside. Sure. Thank you. I've lived in this community for 45 years. I was a teacher at Thomas Manor for 22 years. So I know what Thomas Manor needs. That school needs to be rebuilt. Now, whether it's two-story or one, I don't know what the laws are. I thought we were only supposed to build one-story uh, elementary school. But I want to see our children have good schools, schools that are sound, where kids don't get hurt. And I love the, the, the athletics program. We definitely need it in the future. You want to go see your children play in a nice arena where they won't get hurt. You want to see them do fine arts. We don't have a fine arts place to go. We have a little gym. We need a place where they can showcase their talent. But one of the things that, and, and there is a trust factor here, because all the programs that we had here were not supported and were placed in other schools. Consequently, our children left to follow those programs. I only heard you say, we were going to have one STEM school. And that was going to be an elementary, am I correct? No, I said that Ramona may be the first 
STEM school. In our area. In your area. You have an engineering program at Riverside High School right. now. Right? Yes, I know. And you Some have, of us helped us get, get that program started. And I you know. have all the vocational programs and the culinary arts program, and they're very attractive to all of the schools and even students from outside the district. So there is an understanding by all of us that we need to continue and look for ways to introduce programs to the Riverside area, given that it's the area in the district with the, with the largest decline in enrollment. We also understand that a lot of the students who live in the Riverside area are making a conscious decision to pursue programs at other schools. That is correct. And so what we're saying is, why can't we have our programs here? If we want to make the school viable and have more children and attract more, we need to get those programs back here right. to make the Riverside that everybody remembers. And I think this is what this community needs to have assurances that not only is the building going to be built, but that those programs and those excellent teachers that we've had in the past are going to remain. That is the most important thing. And yes, it's cost, but you know what? I was in the BAC committee that did all the repairs that we had to do for the schools, and we knew it wasn't going to be enough. But there's just so much money to go around, and we understand that. Yes. But assurances have to come from the people at the top that we're going to get those programs and not be promised and then we're forgotten later on. And I think that is the biggest issue that we face when we go to the ballot and say, yes, is this money going to be used properly? Yes. And to your point, whether or not the community supports the bond or we build new facilities, the principal, all of the principals, not just in the Riverside community, but in all communities understand that we can't wait and be held hostage by our facilities. We have to continue and consider programs that are attractive to students, whether or not we get the new schools. So they all know, they all come forward with different ideas. The idea, of course, is finding the resources to support their ideas, but all of them come forward with a lot of great ideas, and we'd like to support them, bond or no bond. Thank you. Yes. Yes, good evening. Good evening. Um, I have a question. You hired uh, engineers from Dallas to figure all this out when we have engineers here in our city that could have done that. Okay, let's say that your plan goes through and all this reconstruction or construction happens. It would be nice if you would hire local construction companies to do all your plans. Also, maybe you should have had options. Okay, this, we have this option. We have this other option and this other option. Maybe some people don't like the combination of a high school with a middle school. Well, then maybe what, I don't know, what the money also can be used is to fix the air conditioning, add, you know, to the fields what they need, the lighting, maybe the turf and all that. But I would like to see if all this goes through, that our community and the people that live here have jobs working on your plan. Yeah, you make a great point. One of the things that uh, I think a lot of people don't realize is that even when school districts or government entities select a construction company or an architect that may not have a main office in El Paso, these people don't bring labor from Dallas or Austin or Houston to do the work in El Paso. They rely on El Paso contractors and subcontractors to do the work. Right now, the impact that the bond that we passed in Socorro in 2011 is having on the economy in Socorro is enormous. Introducing $400, $500 million into the economy here in Isleta would guarantee that masons continue to work and electricians and tradespeople would continue to work because even if the construction company has a corporate headquarter in Dallas, the labor in any case always comes from the local area. But thank you, you're absolutely right. Good evening, Dr. De La Torre. Good my evening. name is Maria Luna, Hola. and my son's an eighth grader at Riverside Middle. Yes, my question to you is, we have uh, trades and industries here in the vocational at Riverside. Yes. And I was wondering, we have automotive, we have cosmetology, um, culinary arts, and like Bel Air, that 
the medical students go over there uh -huh. and they're there all day, why not be part of the student body here? The, all the kids, instead of coming half day for the program, why not be here all day and be part of the Riverside uh, student body? We service all the kids in the district. Mm -hmm. I mean, wouldn't that be good? Too. Right. Now you have to understand that when you're doing something like that and you have students that are in the district that are moving from one school to participate in a program at other schools, that if you ask them to come over and spend the entire day here, you've taken the capacity and utilization problem from Riverside and all you've really done is you've given it to Bel Air now. Because when you're moving students internally, I'll give you a perfect example. Not too long ago, a lot of the elementary schools were asked to move their sixth graders to the middle school because the middle schools were empty. Well, when you move the sixth graders to the middle school, you address the middle school issue, but now you've created a problem at the elementary school. Now the elementary school is empty. So it's like rearranging the, the chairs on the Titanic. This is a career choice. You know, they get licensed or like in mm -hmm. cosmetology. And if they make that career choice, like the medical kids that go to, or to students uh -huh. that go to Bel Air, they're making that career choice. Here, they're doing the same thing with automotive, uh, cosmetology, nail tech, and um, culinary arts. Why not that? It's not everybody that's coming here, but right. the, the, the students that are, why not have this here at Riverside? Why not keep uh, them here the whole day? Yeah, the whole day instead of half day. Okay, uh -huh. I see what I you're mean, saying. And another, Thing is I also understand that the school here is sinking is yes, that sir. yes sir no it isn't well it was brought up to me and we were yes, wondering sir. if anything is going to break up Holbert. Oh, okay. Constance Holbert is was built and, and the soil is allowing it to sink in that Jacobs report what we have is we have the estimate of what it would take to go ahead and elevate the building and support the building that's something that's a recommendation to the board is it possible that it can be made that way if the people in cosmetology or culinary arts can be part of the student body here instead of half day program, a full day, but be here at Riverside. They, they currently have that option. If a student really wanted to be here full time, it's not as if a student from Hanks who's taking the culinary arts program can't remain at the school all day. If they chose to, they could stay here the whole day they're making the decision to go back to their school. So the danger is, if you tell them that if you come to culinary here, you have to stay here all day, my fear is that they may not take advantage of culinary because they want to go back, because their friends are back at their school. So they're getting the benefit of both doing what they want to do as a vocation, as a profession, but they're not really willing to give up their friends from their neighborhood back at the school. They want the best of both worlds, and we want to give them that flexibility. But I understand what your interest is. We have a question in the corner over here. I'm sorry, right here. Yes. I saw the numbers that you were showing, uh -huh. and it just doesn't seem like anything's going to get any better anytime soon. It seems like every year the numbers are going lower and lower and lower. Do you have a plan to try to attract students to come back to YISD and to the Riverside community? I know she was speaking about the vocational program, but it seems like all the attractive the medical program, engineering program, whatever left, and the vocational isn't as attractive as it used to be. Do you have a plan to help out, help bring back enrollment and help the Riverside community since it seems to be shrinking so quickly? Um, do you have any plan to? I understand what you're saying. Yeah. So it's a, it's a two-prong approach. The first Correct. thing is, um, to attract families and students back into the area, they have to leave whatever they're experiencing now and come back to a school district where at least the facilities and the technology is equal to what they're currently experiencing. That's going to be a problem if you're going to try and attract students from Socorro or from one of the newer, fast-growing districts. They're not likely to be attracted by our facilities and our amenities at present. So I think the bond would help in that regard. But going back to what I said, we have to find a way to introduce innovative programs that can only be, that can only be experienced at Riverside. So International Baccalaureate Program at Riverside. Uh, re, uh, a reinvestment in the engineering pro program, Riverside. We've got to find ways to make Riverside High School attractive. And who knows, maybe one day the Health Profession Academy at Bel Air 
will be impacted and we'll have to open a second one. But everybody on my team understands that it's not just about the bond and new facilities and new buildings, it's also about programs and experiences that we need to consider that would be attractive to this school. Like maybe an early college high school built in within the Riverside High School. Something that brings students back or at the very least prevents students from leaving. Okay. Uh, Dr. La Torre, uh, am I hearing correctly that uh, some vocational aspect of River High School is going to be maintained and possibly growing if it's the right thing to do in the future? Here. Here. Yeah, one of the things we just talked about right, is right, right. that our vocational programs um, have remained the same for the last couple of decades, but the vocations have evolved over time and that we may need to reconsider right. what we offer. Right. And, uh, you know, I remember the gentleman over there uh, talking about uh, Riverside's uh, athletic accomplishments. Uh, I'm very familiar with those, but I think there's one accomplishment that very few people here know about. Back in 2001, the company that I worked for, Boeing, I was the chief engineer for Boeing, uh, we worked, two of us worked with the robotics engineering team here, first robotic competition here at Riverside. I think there were four students and two of us engineers and Mr. Chuck Taglibu. I think he's probably retired or whatever. At that time, Riverside had a fantastic machine shop. We built 90% of the robot here, made it from scratch other than the electronics. That robot went on to win first place in the regional, which was Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and Louisiana, and ended up 35th in the nation. Neither UTEP, New Mexico State, Doniana Branch Community College, El Paso Community College, or any high school in El Paso has ever accomplished that. And all because you had a fantastic machine shop, great vocational program, and I'd like to see that resurface in the future. We're very proud. They told me that the children are waiting, so I'd like to thank you all. There's a website where you can ask questions, and you're certainly invited to come to the board meetings. Thank you very much for coming this evening.